So would you get your Bible, please, if you brought along with you, if it's on your phone, uh, that's wonderful too. But grab your Bible and let's turn uh, to the gospel according to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. Now let me kind of, it's a long story, so let me sum up. Jesus went through seasons in his public ministry of popularity and obscurity. There were times, quite frankly, when no one was following Jesus in those three and a half years. There were other times when thousands of people were following him. And this is one of those seasons in his public ministry. He's on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and literally tens of thousands of people are flocking to him and he's laying hands on the sick and they're recovering. He's casting out demons, those who are possessed and oppressed by the evil one. And he's in a season of popularity and, and, and one evening they're all gathered there together and uh, the disciples say, we've got to let these people go home you know, in and outs like three hours away and, and Taco Bell's, you know, along. The, these people need to leave to go get something to eat. And Jesus said, I don't want them to go away. Let's feed them. How are we going to feed these thousands of people? And of course, Andrew said, well, there's this guy has, he's smart enough to have brought a sack lunch. He's got five loaves and, and two fish, but what's that among so many well, it depends on whose hands those resources are in, doesn't it? And so Jesus received this little offering, this love gift, and he thanked the Father for the provision even before he fed the multitudes. And then he began to break the loaves and to break the fish and distribute that which was broken in baskets. His now, these weren't the B-apostles. They were the A-apostles. They were the pick of the litter. So he gave them instructions. They set everybody in order and they began to feed and everyone was filled to overflowing. And we're told by the account that there were 5,000 men and women and children beside. Imagine stretching. That's amazing. There were even leftovers. <laughs> I love to tell the story about my mom. She grew up in the Great Depression. And man, I want to tell you, we never wasted anything. She would make a big meal, and if we couldn't eat it all, I had two older brothers, and we ate like horses. I mean, we were constantly grazing. And uh, she, would, she would make these meals, and I, there were three peas left in the pot. They went to that little Rubbermaid, you know, Tupperware compartment and went into the, the fridge and, and were saved for some other meal. I told Mom, one of these days, I'm going to look in the refrigerator, I'm going to find some fossilized corn because you can't throw anything. You don't waste anything. But Jesus even had leftovers after all of these thousands of people were fed. And let's, let's pick up the story, if you're open there, to Matthew chapter 14 at verse 22, because Luke, excuse me, Matthew uh, carries on the events that took place immediately after that. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat uh, across the Sea of Galilee, and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. Isn't it interesting that the disciples, according to the Gospels, only asked Jesus to teach them one thing? Lord, teach us to pray. Now notice, they didn't ask him, Lord, teach us how to pray. They were Jewish men. As young fellows, they had learned to memorize prayers, the prayers of what we know as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. They knew how to pray. They asked Jesus, teach us to pray. Why do you suppose they asked him that? I believe it's because, just like our account tells us, they would see this amazing power released through Jesus as he laid hands on the sick and broke the bread and fed the multitudes. But they noticed every time that day was over, Jesus went up into the mountain alone and spent the evening in prayer. And then the next day, more power would be released in his ministry. And then another night, alone in prayer. And they saw the correlation between prayer and the releasing of power and they realized, they could have asked him, Lord, teach us to break the bread and feed the multitudes. They could have asked him, teach us how to heal the sick, cast out demons, teach us how to raise the dead. But the only thing they are remembered asking him for 
was, Lord, teach us to pray. I quite frankly believe that that's one of the reasons why the church in America is so powerless today. I was a boy that didn't go to church, but all my friends that went to church, they would tell me I can't go out and play football because I gotta go to the prayer meeting at church. A prayer meeting used to be in every bulletin. I was so refreshed and so blessed when I arrived this morning before first service, and I walked down that long hallway and discovered a circle of leaders here praying out loud before the Lord and seeking Him, and I expect His power to be released here because of those prayers. Lord, teach us to pray. And so Jesus was up on the mountaintop all night long, and when evening came, He was alone there. And He saw the boat, and the storm had risen, and I've been on the Sea of Galilee. It's a big lake, really, the Lake of Kinnisaret, but it's it can get windy because it's deep uh, below sea level and, and the winds come out of uh, the north and out of the west and can really stir that lake up in a moment's notice. And so it's stormy, it's dark, it's early in the morning, probably about 3 a.m. And suddenly Jesus says, well, let me see, they're struggling at the oars. I've sent them across the lake. I'll just walk out to them. Now, I believe Jesus could have flown out there he could have just kind of appeared out there, but he decides to walk on the water, something that we would think is absolutely humanly impossible. But there he is walking, and suddenly his disciples saw him, and they were afraid, and they cried, it's a ghost! And Jesus said, don't be afraid, it is I. And so Peter said, well, if it's you, Lord, bid me to come out on to the water. And I could just see the smile on Jesus' face. Oh, boy. Come on, Peter. Go for it, man. Step out in faith. Now, he didn't say all those words. I'm just paraphrasing. He just said, come. And so, Peter, can you imagine the boat is... Have you ever been on the sea when it's really rough? It's hard enough standing on the deck of the boat, let alone getting out of the boat. But Peter does it. He pulls one, probably one leg over, and then the next. And all of a sudden, he's doing what's humanly impossible. He's walking on the water. But listen, it's not that smooth, glassy surface that we love at Lake Shasta early in the morning when we put our skis on or get our knee boards out to get on that glass. I mean, this water is rolling up and down. The boat is bouncing up and down. And I can see that uh, if you've ever been out to the ocean and been on when it's really rough, they can see Jesus and then they can't see Jesus and then they can see Jesus and then they can't see Jesus and then they can see Jesus he's getting a little closer and then and because of going up and down on these waves Jesus is walking over these waves and Peter is now walking over these waves and many commentators cast a critical eye at Peter at this point oh Peter you took your eyes off of Jesus shame on you I think he was trying to keep Jesus in view it was early in the morning. It was pitch black. It was raining. It was pounding. He was going up a wave and down a wave. And oh, Jesus, I think you're out there. I have my doubts. But then all of a sudden he began to sink because the wind was so boisterous. And man, I can totally identify. He's just going down in a hurry. And he cries out, Lord, save me. And of course, Jesus quoted that oftentimes quote, God helps those who help themselves. No, it was boisterous, all right. It was a storm. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, listen, I, a lot can be learned if we could have been there and heard the tone of voice. Just suppose Jesus had his hands on his hip like mom. Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Was he wagging his finger in Peter's face? What a failure, fool. Why are you going down? You just don't have any faith. No, I think I hear the tone of Jesus, my Savior, saying, oh, Peter, you stepped out of the boat. You had a little faith, but doubt got in your way. You ever have doubts? I do. 
I doubt if you guys will like me after this message is over. <laughs> no, I'm just seeing silly. Billy Graham had doubts. He was attending Bible school in Pensacola, Florida. And he was hearing the upper critics talking about the scholarly view of Scripture and can we really trust that the Bible is the literal Word of God or were these men just imagining what they were thinking as they were writing? And he heard the criticisms and so forth. And he tells the story in his autobiography about he's there at school and it's late at night and, and, and like me, Billy loved to golf and right next to the college is a golf course and it's late at night, nobody's playing. But he just had this moment of doubt. I wonder, is the Bible really the literal word of God? And so he went for a little walk. He started on the first tee and he walked the entire golf course just alone talking to God. And he relates about how he got to the 18th green, and there he fell on his knees and said as he was wrestling with his doubts, Lord, I confess to you, I have my doubts. There's many things I don't understand that are written in the Bible. There are many things I can't even try to explain. But I believe deep down in my heart, without a doubt, that the Bible is true, and the Bible is the Word of God. And from this day forward, I will trust every jot and tittle, every word in the Bible. And one of the, my greatest memories as a child was seeing him hold up that big old Bible and say, the Bible says. And the doubts were gone. He admitted later, I, I still can't understand everything that's in that book. I can't even try sometimes to explain it, but I believe and I trust that it is the literal word of God. How are doubts dispelled in, in our life? Well, first off, we have to realize what doubt is and how it's dispelled. The account goes on in verse 33 of our text. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. It was the act of Jesus not letting Peter sink beneath the waves of that stormy sea, but reaching out the hand of mercy like we sang as Luke led us in worship and trusting that God was honoring Peter's faith. And he said, oh, you of little faith. It was a good attempt, Peter. Doubt got in the way. And he lifted Peter and they got in the boat and then all the disciples doubts. Remember, they doubted. Who is it? It's a ghost. They were afraid. Fear is the fuel of doubt. That's why girls pick petals off of flowers. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. There are doubts, aren't there? Even the greatest affection, the greatest tension that's, attention that's given us, we wonder, does he really love us? Does, do they really care? Do they? We have doubts, and we need to recognize that. But it's the work of God's Holy Spirit and the acts of Jesus Christ that are able to dispel all our doubts and fears. And I hope today that you'll leave this room and say, without a doubt, I know that truly Jesus is the Son of God. Doubt is defined in the, bi in the dictionary excuse me, as a feeling of uncertainty or lack of conviction. Now, feelings are vulnerable. Faith is wise. It's like the old Chinese pro, uh, you know, proverb. Faith, fact, and feeling were walking along a wall, a precipitous point. And as long as faith had its eyes on fact, feeling followed right along with them. But as soon as faith turned around to see how feeling was doing, they both fell off the wall. Feelings are powerful, there's no doubt about it, but truly when you have the feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction, doubt is dangerous because doubt makes us vulnerable to deception. Jesus pulled the mask off of the deceiver. He identified Satan, 
the father of lies, a deceiver and a destroyer. Isn't it interesting that Jesus acknowledged our vulnerability to deception when they were there in Jerusalem on the Mount of Olives and his disciples came and asked him three questions. When will these things be? You know, the stones fallen off of the temple and the end of the age and the sign of your coming. And Jesus, over and over there in Matthew chapter 24, said, Let no man, what? Deceive you. For many will come in my name. And he described in great detail the vulnerability of even believers to be subject to deception. That's why doubts are dangerous and they need to be dealt with. You may have come this morning and you have your doubts about whether this is all really genuine and and really worthwhile and, and worth pursuing and worth continuing. And I believe that the Lord wants to dispel those doubts because deception is one thing. The deceiver is truly our adversary and we need to pull the mask off of his agents and his agenda because ultimately deception leads to perpetual deception, which is called delusion in the Bible. In fact, Paul warns us that those who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, who don't respond to the truth, will actually be sent into strong delusion because of their rejection of the truth. That's a frightening thing to consider. But have you looked at TV recently? This country has gotten delusional already. Many of the arguments that people who oppose the good news of Jesus Christ offer are absolutely unreasonable. It's not just deception, but the perpetual stage of deception that we define as delusion. You can't reason with people who are convinced that killing a baby is perfectly a woman's right, but killing a whale is somehow the cardinal sin. That's unreasonable, folks. That's deception at its worst. And it's leading to delusion. And that's why we need to cut it off at the pass. We need to deal with doubts. Well, Peter, of course, was rescued that day. His doubts dispelled as Jesus reached down and lifted him up as he was sinking into the water in the Sea of Galilee. Peter still had problems, he still had doubts. He had pride that needed to be dealt with. Oh, though all of these forsake you, Jesus, I never will. And Jesus, Peter, I tell you truly, before the, the shofar is blown in the morning, you will have denied me three times. Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but when you are restored, Strengthen your brothers. How many of you know that God is not just a God of salvation? He's a God of restoration. He loves to take those who have made a mess and restore them. And Peter had made a mess of things. He had proudly declared that he would never, he was ready to go to prison. He was ready to die for Jesus. And yet Peter was told the truth by Jesus. Here's the facts, Jack. You're going to deny me three times before the night is done. And of course, Peter, after the shofar was blown, went out and wept bitterly. Don't you know that brokenness, and I think I'm speaking a word to this church, brokenness has to come before repentance and restoration can occur. That's what I've been praying for for these last 12 months, is brokenness in the life of an individual I love very dearly and have known for years and years and years. Because it's only through brokenness that genuine repentance can take place. And then restoration. In fact, you know, Paul wrote that letter to the Corinthians, you know. It's unheard of a man is living with his mother. Are you kidding me? And you're honoring him in the church? I tell you truly, I've already judged this situation. When you've come together, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his soul may be saved. And so he had to write a second letter now that that's worked, <laughs> that brokenness and repentance has happened. Now restore that one. Love on him and receive him back into fellowship. The work of the Spirit is done. 
So Peter went out and wept bitterly. And Jesus was taken and nailed to a cross. They took him down from the cross and laid him in a tomb. And three days later, Peter heard this announcement that he's no longer in the tomb. Peter James ran and got to the tomb. And Jesus, as we're told in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Peter came first. Jesus went to Peter privately and restored him just like he had prayed. And then he restored him publicly. John chapter 20 carries that account when there by the shores of Galilee. Do you love me really more than... He wasn't talking about the fish, folk. He was talking about the disciples. You love me more than these guys? You know I love you, Jesus. Feed my sheep. And three times, because Jesus had been denied three times by Peter, Jesus restores Peter. And then the day of Pentecost came. They were all gathered, 120 of them, in the upper room. Now remember, these are Jews. And how did God demonstrate to their ancestors that he was present with them in the tabernacle? Anybody remember? Cloud by day, a pillar of what? Over the place where God dwelt, the tabernacle, at night. That's so cool. Light to read by, light to navigate by, but the significance that God is present with us. We have nothing to fear. He's here. So what happened on that day as the Holy Spirit came, what appeared over the head of all of the 120 gathered there, men, women, and children, the very same pillar of fire that had stood over the tabernacle, the Holy Spirit now confirming as Jesus had prophesied, you're the temple of God now. He's present in you, and he's upon you. And Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he preached, and 3,000 souls came to faith in Jesus Christ that day. But there was a man who was not sinking under the waters of the Sea of Galilee, but he was sinking in the pit of despair. He had never walked in his life. He was lame from birth. And every day he was dependent on family or friends or neighbors to carry that lifeless legged body and, and lay him at the gate beautiful. Why there? Because that's where all the traffic in and out of the temple would go. I've been uh, on the temple mountain, walked those steps, very steep, but there he was at the gate beautiful, uh, absolutely dependent upon the goodwill of those who would come along as he begged for money. He begged for money. And of course, the book of Acts tells us that Peter and John and James were just on their way up to church to pray. Remember, they had asked Jesus, teach us to pray. And he, they also realized that Jesus had said, you've, you've made this a den of thieves, but my father's house is a house of prayer. And so Peter and John are going up to the temple, Acts chapter 3, and a certain man lame from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms from those who entered the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. In that hustle and bustle of people, Peter wanted to make sure that they made eye contact. Look at us. So he gave them his attention, reached out his right hand, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. And immediately he took him by his right hand and lifted him up. You realize what kind of faith it takes to lift someone in a wheelchair or lame from birth to their feet? That could be a very embarrassing moment, yes? But Peter had that faith. It was a gift of the Holy Spirit gave. And he grabbed that man by the right hand and he lifted him up. And we read that he went walking and leaping and praising God. In other words, he was having fun in church. I hope you think church is fun. We used to sing this song back in the Jesus movement. If you're old enough, you'll remember it. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. 
in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk, walking and leaping and praising God, walking and leaping and praising God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Why doesn't that happen in the church today? Because the church is not a house of prayer. Much prayer, much power. Little prayer, little power. But did you notice? Did you see it? Did you get it? Jesus had said to the boys, the A apostles, not the B apostles, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will he do. Peter was simply fulfilling, literally, the prophecy of Jesus. You see, what Jesus had done for Peter as he was sinking into the sea of Galilee and Jesus lifted him up and he was standing on water and was back in the boat. Peter did to that man who was sinking in despair and despondency and Peter did just what Jesus had done for him and he lifted him to his feet and he was instantly healed. Hallelujah. Can I hear an amen in the house of God? What has Jesus done for you? Has he saved you? Has he lifted you out of your doubt, your despair? Were you sinking under the waves and the, the troubles of life and water and, and everything that was against you? And you cried out, even though you had your doubts, Jesus, rescue me? Well, did he stand and go, well, he just don't have enough faith. Why do you doubt? No, he reached out to you and he lifted you out of your despair and your despondency and he set your feet on a solid rock. And now he's simply inviting you to do for others what he did for you. There's that wonderful story when Billy was preaching in Los Angeles, you know, the canvas tent uh, revival. It was only supposed to last a week and ended up lasting nearly a year. Stuart Hamlin, who was a country star long before Roy Rogers, a radio personality in Southern California, invited his good friend, the Duke, John Wayne, to go see this young, fiery preacher preach on Hollywood Boulevard. And John Wayne accepted the invitation and, and went with Stuart Hamlin. They went uh, to hear Billy preach. And they saw the people streaming forward to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ. That's one thing I admired about Billy. He always made Jesus the main thing, the word of God. I can remember my dad was a newspaper man and he oftentimes got off just as the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson was, was on. And so again, Denny's the remote, I would turn it to NBC and we would watch Johnny. And oftentimes in the summertime when I was visiting my father, Billy Graham was a guest of Johnny Carson on the Tonight Show. And, and Johnny would try to steer the conversation to some trivial little thing. And Billy just kept playing that one string guitar. <laughs> Jesus loves you, Johnny. When are you going to respond to the good news of Jesus Christ? And your audience needs to know that God loves them and you can trust the Bible and you should turn to Jesus right here, right now. Isn't that good? Isn't that great? Well, Stuart Hamlin, Johnny... Uh, excuse me, the Duke, uh, John Wayne, watched all these people stream forward. John did not respond. Stuart had done so previously, days before, and announced it to his radio audience the next morning that he had decided to give his life to Jesus Christ. And so they're walking back to their vehicle on Hollywood Boulevard, and uh, the Duke turned to Stuart and said, uh, wow, I, I never knew these things that I heard tonight. And Stuart turned to John Wayne and said, John, it is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do for you. And of course, that wonderful song was the result. Stuart then took that statement and turned it into a lyric of a song. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. But what has he done for you? Has he lifted you up? then here's the joy that you get to participate in. When you see that lame individual, 
You are just going to church and you see somebody sinking into the pit of discouragement and, and despair. Well, don't just pray for them. Reach out a hand of fellowship and lift them up in the name of Jesus Christ and watch what God can do. I pray that you'll leave this room this morning and say, you know, I had some doubts, but the Holy Spirit has dispelled those doubts. And I'm now reminded once again that Jesus picked me up and lifted me out of what I was sinking in. And so Lord, help me to get my eyes off myself and turn. Remember, he, he looked at that man and said, now look on us. That requires eye contact. And he looked on him. And he said, we don't have any money, but what we have, we give. So that one who Jesus commented about, O oh, you of little faith, had the faith because of what Jesus had done for him and the power of the Holy Spirit to take that lame man by his right hand and lift him up. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your goodness and your grace. Lord, you've been so kind and so good to us. You've blessed us. You've lifted us up out of the sinking sand, the quicksand that we were sinking in. And Lord, you have restored us, set our feet upon a solid rock. And Lord, I, I just wonder if there are some sitting in these chairs or listening online this morning that would be, be willing to cry out to you and say, help me, Lord, I'm sinking. I, I, I'm going down. And I wonder, while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, if you'll do what Peter did, if you'll do what the lame man at the gate did, and simply, just symbolically, would you just take your right hand and reach out for Jesus? Right here, right where you're sitting. Just reach out for him. He wants to lift you up out of the depression, the sense of disappointment and discouragement that you've been feeling. Some of you have been considering the worst alternative. You've been thinking about ending it all, taking your own life. The Lord's here to tell you that he loves you, and he's not finished with you, and he's not only the God of salvation, he's the God of restoration. All you need to do is reach out to him, and he'll lift you up. And so, Father, I pray blessing upon these precious ones. Pastor Greg, would you close us, please? Lord, <clears throat> Lord, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness, Lord, and what an, an appropriate message for us to hear, that healing process that, Lord, you begin. Lord, you work in us and through us. Lord, uh, as we think about all that's been happening here and the discipleship that's going on, that we're to minister to one another. Lord, we, we thank you for that. Lord, that, that's a beautiful picture from, from you, Lord, that we have needs, Lord, each of us. Each of us struggles, each of us in a different place. But that's uh, your work, Lord, your body working together to do those things. And we just do pray, Lord, that you would equip us. Lord, reach into our hearts, change us. Lord, you're not done with us. You're still healing our hurts. And, Lord, you're, you're the author and finisher of our faith. Lord, you began a good work, so complete it. And uh, so, Lord, we just uh, thank you for this time. Thank you for Pastor Denny. Thank you for that message from you, Lord. It was timely and needed. And so we just give you the glory. We praise you in your precious name. Amen.